Well, good morning. We're going to talk this morning about kingdom culture. We're also going to be talking about uh, we're going to talk about God's goodness, and then uh, we're going to receive communion. So I, I need to do it right now, or I'll forget. Is uh, communion is open to every person who's a follower of Jesus Christ. And so if you're not a part of this church, but you would still like to take communion, we warmly and welcome you to come take communion with us. However, let me throw in this little warning. It's not good to take communion if you're not serving Jesus, you're not right with God. It'd be a whole lot better for you not to do those things. And I'm not saying this in a threatening way or in a badgering way, but communion is where we reflect upon what Jesus did for us. The Bible's very clear that Jesus went to the cross, and on the cross it says that Jesus literally became my sin and your sin. That Jesus on the cross took all the stuff in our life that's not right and placed it upon himself. And so communion is for us to take a moment to reflect on what Jesus did in that moment, that he literally became sin so that you and I might have right standing with God. In fact, let me go a little bit further on this. The whole thing about being a Christ follower is not what you can do for God. It's not looking at saying, okay, well, if I read my Bible, pray, give money, spend time doing these things, then God has to bless me. He will bless you, but God's nature, what we're talking about is his goodness, and it's never based upon your performance. It's always based upon what Jesus has done. So that's what makes Christianity different from every other religion. It's not, a, it's not on how hard you work to climb the ladder, if you would, to get to heaven. It's allowing heaven to come to earth so the presence of God and the life of God flows through you and it's not based on your performance. It's what Jesus did at the cross. Does everybody understand that? And so that's what communion is. It's a celebration of what God has done in our lives. Amen. All right, so having said that, let me just say this, is that the uh, last week we had a circuit riders, a traveling group of ministers that came through, young people committed to God, had a great service, great turnout. But I had a chance to stand in the back. And I'm in the back looking, watching. And all I can tell you is you're, if you're past four, four rows back in this, in this setting, God bless you, because I'm telling you, there is so much activity going on. I don't know how you can hear anything up front, because I'm in the back, and it's just like one thing after another, and people in and out, up and down, and I'm like, I can even hear what the speaker's saying, because it's got so much distraction going on. But having said that, we have some incredible people that are doing some amazing things. The setup crew with Sean, Crater, C, Sean Cater and C3 Sports came in. They did the stage, the chairs, all that, like that, that set up. We have an audio team and a visual team that are back there. And I want you guys to try and give them a big hand because those guys are awesome. They're doing an amazing job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just telling you, they don't get enough recognition for what they do. And just to give you guys reports, we've got reports every week. Just thousands of people are watching live streaming on Facebook, et cetera. And they're coming and they're hearing uh, the good news of what Jesus is doing. And I just want to just encourage you guys God has something good for you. Oral Roberts used to say that all the time at the end of his television broadcast. Oral Roberts would say, God has something good for you. How many know that we're living in a time and an age to say that God is good and that God has something good for you really contradicts our culture? We had, you know, last week the Parkland shooting. And since the beginning of the year, January 1st, 2018, up till today, We've had 18 school shootings in our country. Who would have thought that to come to church or to go to school, that we would have fear of losing your life? Something is wrong with our culture. In fact, when you think about it, a lot of people say, well, let's just ban guns and let's just do away with weapons. Let me just assure you, before guns were invented, man or mankind still knew how or knows how to kill one another. It may reduce the amount of, you can kill at one time. But you go all the way back to the original beginning of the family, the first family in the Garden of Eden. It says that Cain killed Abel, his brother. It was all over religion too. So I'm submitting to you that our culture we've embraced in America, listen to me, We've embraced a culture of death. And I say that based upon the abortion issue. 
the safest place for a little person to be would be in the womb of their mother. And we've lost millions and millions and millions of Americans because of abortion. So we've devalued human life. So if someone's got a pair of tennis shoes on that you like, we'll just kill the guy and take his shoes or get his jacket. Or someone's out dating your ex-girlfriend or your current girlfriend or wife or whatever, we'll just kill them. Or your spouse is not living right. Usually it's the guys, they go off because the little lady wants to divorce them because they're acting like such a jerk and then they can't take it and they kill the wife and the kids. And you see these reports all the time. We have embraced a culture of death. And the church, you and I, have been called by Jesus Christ to exhibit the nature of God. And God's nature is good. There's not one shadow of turning in him. There's not one iota of doubt. There's not one thing in the nature of God that ever remotely comes close to evil or doing harm to someone else. God's nature is absolutely 100% pure good. It's his goodness. And so we talk about a kingdom culture. We're talking about serving a God who's completely good regardless of what's going on in your circumstances. Because a lot of times what a lot of us don't understand is that Jesus is wanting to train you and I to rule and reign with him in his kingdom. Listen to what he says in Luke 19, our first verse. And by the way, I'm sorry, Luke 22. As I understand, we don't have all the scriptures up this morning, so you may have to get your Bibles out. And that leads me to another thought. Pastor Dean has shared this, but I'm saying it again. This past Saturday morning, we spent three hours with our church in the Word, studying the Word, how to study the Word, looking at the versions. How do we get this you know, King James Version? How do we get these different type of versions in the Bible? How do you know the Word of God? Letting the Holy Spirit speak to you and through you, and as you open the Word of God, let God minister to you. And I'm just telling you, it was powerful. It was a powerful, powerful moment. In fact, it was so good that many of you know that on Saturdays, our C3 our crew does a lot of birthday parties. And so yesterday was private birthday parties. So a family was coming into the sanctuary. We're on one half of it, uh, all about 50 of us. And then there's some, they were on the other side. And they were over here about the last 20 minutes of the seminar. And a lady approached me. She said, what are you guys doing? I said, well, we're a church and we're, you know, kind of setting up our for as a church about how we like to study the Bible, like to study the Word of God, get to know God better. And uh, she said, well, is it open to anybody? I said, yeah. I said, if you'd like to come, and we showed her the booklet we had and what we're going through. She said, I love the Word of God. I want to grow in it. And I said, well, next month we're going to be talking about prayer and how you can understand God and hear God and, and walk with God, and that's what prayer is all about. She said, well, can I come? And I said, well, sure. So she went with Pastor McConnell signed up. So we have, through the birthday parties, a lady coming to our next uh, leadership training and equipping. So there you go. All right, so listen to what Jesus said in Luke twenty two twenty nine. 29. He says, so as my Father has given me a kingdom, I'm giving it to you. The word kingdom there would be dominion, influence, and will. Jesus is telling you and I that his kingdom that he's received from the Father, he's transferring to you and I, his kingdom. That Jesus has asked you and I that we'd be willing to go through the training to reign with him in this life. So you can say it this way, that you're being trained to reign with Christ. And the way you get trained is through tests and trials and temptations. And when you're going through tests and trials and temptations, it's never fun. In fact, when you're going through tests, trials, and temptations, a lot of times we want to have the doubt in our mind that God's not really for me. A lot of times we want to have the doubt in our mind that we're going through bad stuff that God's against me. I, have, I can't tell you the number of people who've told me, you know, Pastor Mitch, if I come into your church, the building's going to fall down because God will be so amazed that I came to church. Or you have the other time where people think that, well, you know, they're, 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 they think that God is angry and that God is mad. And that God has lightning bolts, and as soon as they do something wrong, he unleashes those lightning bolts, and you're about to get zapped. And there's a lot of times that people have this image of God being angry. God's angry at sin and what it does to people, but God is not an angry God. In fact, I believe that one of the greatest misconceptions we have is we don't spend enough time talking about the goodness of God and who God is and what God can do. I know this is Black History Month, but... 
There was a, I just read this story about this girl that was in the movie, the Black Panther movie. And her name is Letitia Wright. She plays, I think, Princess Shuri on the film. And she talked about, at, she's 20, I think she's 24 years old. She said, I had to take a break from acting. She said, acting was so important to me, it was, it was consumed me, it possessed me. And she said, I realized that I'm in a culture where I need to find a different set of values. So she took a break for seven months and said, I just want to pursue God and get to know God. In the midst of her seven-month journey, she found out that she never had a relationship with Jesus Christ. She gave her life to him, said, Jesus, I want to serve you, I love you. If you don't want me to act anymore, I won't act anymore, God. I just want to please you. How many know that's a real relationship with Christ when you're willing to surrender to him the most valuable thing in your life? And so she did it. So Letitia Wright did it. She said, God, I just surrendered to you. So God opened the door. She goes back. And, of course, the Black Panther movie is a setting all kind of records, superhero, and all this kind of cool stuff. But what I'm trying to communicate to you is that she says that serving Jesus Christ is more to her than acting. And she's got another big movie coming out in March under Steven Spielberg, and she's got some other things coming on. But I'm just, it just encourages me that when we talk to you about serving Jesus, no matter what capacity you're in, when you're serving him, God has good plans in store for you. That God has something good in store for your life. You can trust that. You can believe that. So when I talk about the goodness of God, I'm not talking about a Pollyanna attitude as you go through life and you never notice anything bad. That's not it. It's just that you and I have been called because we're training to reigning to bring the kingdom of God and the influence of God in our culture. We've been called, like for instance, I was thinking about this on Saturday morning. We have a celebration here in State College. This is for people on live stream. We have a celebration here in State College called State Patty's Day. And we have lots, thousands of people that come into town that just want to drink their hearts out. And I was looking at the number of young people that were here Saturday morning doing Bible study with us in that room. And I thought, you know what? They want to be world changers. They want to be the opposite of our culture. They're not buying into what our culture, if you would, the Kool-Aid, our culture is feeding us. They're wanting to study the Word of God. They're wanting to let God's word be the dominant influence in their life. Just like the young lady I talked about, Letitia Wright, when she found out that you could serve Jesus Christ and have a relationship with him, and that if he wanted to take her out of acting, she could trust him with her life, he was able to entrust her with greater prominence, greater role, greater influence than she ever had before. God has some incredible plans for you, and the way you buy into it, is you have to understand with the very nature of God, he's a good God. Listen to what it says in Psalm 65, 11. It says, you crown the year with your goodness, and richness overflows wherever you are. Wherever God is, what richness overflows. God says he, what? he crowns your year with goodness. So no matter whether you've had an up year or a down year in the stock market, no matter whether you've had a great marriage or a bad marriage, no matter whether your kids are doing great or terrible, I'm telling you, it doesn't change the nature of God. God's still good. God is still good. His nature is to give. Let me tell you about the nature of our God. I've been thinking about this. Do you know the Bible says that God loves the wicked people as much as he loves the righteous people? And I'm thinking, how does that work? I got people that I don't even like that aren't really wicked towards me. I just, you know, we just don't like. And God has to deal with me about my attitude. Mitch, you got to love everybody. And God pours out, it says, the rain on the just and the unjust. That Jesus, as he walked through the earth on Jerusalem, had people that were in his face, and it never changed his goodness. He had people who had studied the Bible, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders of the community that knew the Word of God, but they missed the living Word of God because they didn't know that God was good. They thought that God was to judge their enemies, that God was to do, do, do harm to their enemies, and that God was going to take those wicked Roman soldiers and banish them into the sea. And Jesus came along and said, Really? 
He said, I tell you what, when a Roman soldier comes up to you and says, I need you to carry my equipment this mile, you go two miles, carry the equipment for them. You do double of what they ask you. How many know that's hard? How many know that's not fun? How many know that takes you out of your schedule? Like all of a sudden, <clears throat> you had plans to go one way, and here comes a soldier, and you're running the other way, and you meet the other soldier. And he traps you into conscription. And he says, I need you to go to take this luggage of mine down the road. And Jesus said, be good, be gracious. Give, share. That's the role we're called to do as the church. That's what God's called us to do to influence our culture. That's the message that we're to bring as we go through our daily life. I serve a good God. I serve an amazingly good God. How do I know that? Because he adopted me and put me in his family. How do I know I serve an amazing God? Because of all the changes he's brought about in my life. How do I know I serve a good God? Because he's cleansed my conscience. How do I know I serve a good God? Because I know that it's his love and kindness towards me that he chose me before the worlds were formed to be in his family. And I choose to live my life that way, how about you? Does that mean that I'm full of goodness all the time? As my wife and children can tell you, no, I'm not. But I strive to let the goodness of God radiate and reflect out of my life. How about you? And so when you have this in mindset, you have this intentionality, we serve a good God. We serve a great God. We serve a God who's not only so good and awesome, but a God that has good intentions for your life. And when you believe that and invest in it, I'm telling you what, you'll find all the depression drop in your life. You'll find all the worry and anxiety about your future drop in your life. You'll find out that as you go with God and walk with God and know God and hear God and fellowship with God, you'll find out that His goodness just rubs off into your life. And you'll find out that you just all start being good to people that don't even deserve it. You'll find yourself on the road. Instead of having road rage, you'll have road prayer. You'll just, you'll just be blessing people. Just blessing them. Just blessing them. You'll just, be, you'll just be amazed at how God just changes your life. You'll just be like, God, you're so good to me. Listen to what it says. Here's a great verse. Here's what it says in Psalms 107.8. <clears throat> oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And we have it in my notes here. It says the depth of praise will determine the magnitude of your breakthrough. I'm just telling you, if you're in a bad spot, just begin to thank God for his goodness. I mean, just begin to honor God and just get after it. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm going to make a little plug here, a little commercial for Wednesday nights. Wednesday nights, we have some of the most amazing testimonies that are coming up. And I just so enjoy the Wednesday night service. It's like we come together, and we're singing, worshiping the Lord, and then people start sharing the goodness of God and what God's doing in their life. And there's healings and miracles and salvations and deliverance and, and financial breakthrough and all this kind of stuff. And it's just fun to praise the Lord because you're hearing the goodness of God being exhibited in different situations. And you're like, God, you are so amazing. So amazing. We'll hear, we'll hear coming up, I think this coming Wednesday, about a couple that couldn't have a child and now they're expecting a child. We're going, to hear, we're going to hear some other stories of people who had some uh, incurable diseases that have been healed. Just heard a story about a, a lady that had a brain tumor, and God's healed her completely and told her she's been set free. That's a hand. That's a hand. Give the Lord a praise for that. That was naughty. Yeah. There's other, there are other people in our, in our PDC. I'm looking at Pastor Lay. There's other people that have just been healed miraculously of different things on their deathbed, and Jesus has resurrected them. Guys, we serve a good God. And if we'll praise him and thank him, no matter what's going on in your life, if you'll praise him, thank him, worship him, honor him, just celebrate his goodness, not your life, it's his goodness, you'll find it to bring a difference in your life. All of a sudden you realize that you're walking on top of your circumstances, not underneath. You'll realize that, God, I can honor you, and by honoring you, by praising you, worshiping you, and you're a good God with good plans for my life, all of a sudden it puts you in a good place. And you realize you can just enjoy life because you're serving a good God. And because of that, you can worship God all the time. Let's go on. The Bible tells us this in Isaiah 64, 4. It says, since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, 
No eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. When we think about waiting, we think about being idle, and that's not the Hebrew word here. The word wait means that you're preparing and getting ready. It's like a bride who's getting ready for her wedding. Even though she's waiting for the day, how many know that she is not inactive? She's not just sitting around thinking about, no, she's making, any of you ever been through weddings, have two daughters, been through weddings, I can just tell you, Thank God I have to go through that anymore. But I'm just telling you, there are so many things to go on when you're ready, getting ready or waiting for that wedding day. In the same way, the Bible says that you can't believe what happens to those who wait on God. Let me give you a clue. When you're waiting on God and you're seeking God and you're putting Him first, the Bible tells us, and we'll look at this in just a moment, in Psalms 23, it says, Surely, the last verse, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. When you're waiting on God, listen to me, when you're waiting on God, surely goodness and mercy will follow me. Another translation says it will pursue me. Another version says it's going to overtake me. Another version says the goodness of God will wash you up, almost like being at the ocean and being caught up in a, have you ever been hit by a wave and it just washes over you, just knocks you down. That's what it gives the indication of the goodness of God. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That's a promise. That's a promise you can bank on. That's a promise you can live your life by. That's a promise that you can take, if you would, to the bank and put it in that deposit box, and it will keep you going straight and keep you going up in the things of God. But there are some conditions to this promise, and I want to read these. Most of us are familiar with the Psalm of the Shepherd in Psalms 23. Let's look at this. Verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What does that mean? That means that Jesus satisfies you. Like I talked about earlier about that actress, Letitia Wright. She found out that Jesus brought greater satisfaction to her soul than her acting career and being famous and making lots of money. I mean, oh, that's pretty good. How many know when you say that Jesus is my shepherd, also says in several different scriptures that he's the author and he's the guardian and he's the bishop of our souls, that he's the chief shepherd. How many know that sheep by nature follow, but cattle by nature are driven. So if you want to be a cow, you're going to get driven. If you want to be a sheep, you need to follow the shepherd. The shepherd leads you. And so we're going to look at this, these seven promises or seven conditions that God has for us. Number one, it says he makes me to lie down in green pastures. That's what we talked about yesterday in our Bible seminar. We're talking about how to study the Word of God, the green pastures, letting God minister to you, letting God speak to you, letting the Word of God feed your soul, letting the Word of God give you the character that we need to have to do the things that Jesus is asking of the church to do in this day and age. Number two, it says that He leads me beside the still waters. Another word for still would be peace. When the kingdom of God comes into your life, the prince of peace also walks in to your life. And we should not be living uptight, anxious, fearful lives. You and I should be in a place where the peace of God, he leads me beside the still waters, his peace becomes my peace. His joy becomes my joy. It's such, a, it's such an, an incredible transformation when those things begin to take place in your life. Number three is this, he restores my soul. And many of us will start to bring with me this morning, maybe I'll do it down the road, is I've got this little green creature that's all about stinking thinking, bad thoughts. Bad thoughts come into your mind, and you can't control those thoughts. But you can control how long you think about those thoughts. And for a lot of us, we think the wrong thoughts for long periods of time. Like, for instance, we think life is all about us. It's not. If God puts you here for his purpose, then your life is not your own. If God placed you on this earth for a destiny, then I would submit to you, it would help you to find out your destiny in God. It would help you to find out what he's prepared you for. It would be like George Washington Carver, the great scientist that said, God put me on this earth 
to discover things. And he was praying one time, and he asked God, he said, God, show me the secrets of the universe. And God said, no, I can't do that. It's too big for you. So he prayed again and said, God, well, what can you show me? And God said, you know what? He says, I'm going to show you the secrets of the peanut. And George Washington Carver, the famous African-American scientist, had over 300 uses for the peanut. He had some incredible insights, not just in peanut, but in certain things, Tuskegee Institute, I think Alabama A&M, all these schools. He had an incredible role because he knew how to humble himself and pray and seek God. You see, you have a destiny. You have a purpose in God. I would encourage you this morning to find that purpose and find that destiny because life is not about you. I can tell you this. I was listening to a guy preach the other day, and he was talking about his dream growing up was to play football and to be a coach. And he said, and God called me into the ministry. And his last name happened to be Dollar. He goes, can you imagine having a minister whose last name is Dollar? Everybody knows you're in it just for the money, you know. Reverend Dollar. Well, my point in saying these things to you is that you never know the destiny that God has for you until you let him lead you. Until you let him guide you. Let him be your shepherd. Let him train you. Let him equip you. Let God take you to that next level of where you're at in your stations in life. Goes on as we're wrapping up. It says, He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So let him lead you. He says, It goes on to say, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I did a series one time just on this whole psalm, Psalm 23. We could spend a week on every one of these topics and just expound on those things. But the staff and the rod is for prodding and for protection. Sometimes God needs to goad us into action. And there's other times we've acted on the wrong impulse, and God has to get that shepherd's staff, the crook, to pull us out of danger and harm's way. He wants to be our shepherd. Your rod and your staff, so you don't have to fear evil. You can walk with God. Moving on to the next one, it says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. And I want you to take just one quick second and think about this. There are enemies that come against your soul. It could be fear, it could be doubt, it could be worry, it could be unbelief, it could be pride. It could be just a ton of things that just harass you and torment you. And the Bible says that God prepares a table for you in the presence of your enemies. So that means that Satan is always there to try to accuse you and accuse God. And God says, no, I'm going to set a buffet table for you. Now, depending on what you like to eat, I guess it gets on your buffet table. But think about dining with Jesus in the presence of your enemies. You don't have to fear them. You don't have to be uh, uh, overcome by them. That you can have a feast in the midst, in the midst of these ongoing battles with your enemies. You prepare a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. Listen to what he says then. He goes on to say, you anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. The anointing of the Holy Spirit on your life will push you over the top. The anointing of the Holy Spirit will cause you to overcome every situation, every adversary, every obstacle in your life. The anointing of God, we're told in Isaiah, breaks every yoke. So as a son of God or as a daughter of God, you do not have to fear that you're going to allow things to come in and torment you and overtake you, that you can walk in freedom, you can walk in liberty, you can walk in faith because the anointing of God causes your cup to run over. And if you're doing these conditions, we're going to go to the promise. Here's the fulfillment. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What an incredible promise God makes to us. As we get ready to receive communion, I want you to think about surely goodness and mercy will pursue me and follow me all the days of my life. 
You know what? I know it's I think I said this earlier, I know it's Black History Month, but you know one of the most neglected figures, I think, in black history that doesn't get recognized is Simon of Cyrene. He was from, they say, around Libya, Cyrene, northern Africa. And he came to Jerusalem to worship the Lord. He came to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast. And as he's coming in, he hears about this man that was supposedly a prophet and that he brought his two sons with him and they were there to worship the Lord and honor the Lord by the festival. And that as they got closer and closer, that they got curious about what was going on about this innocent man that had been condemned and a criminal had been released named Barabbas. And this man claimed he was God, Jesus. And as he walks and he looks with horse, he sees this beaten figure almost beyond recognition struggling down the street with a big heavy eye beam on his back. The Roman soldiers press him into service. And they say, Simon, we need you to carry the cross for Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but, you know, the Bible tells us very clearly, and this is really easy to say, hard to do, that we're to be crucified with Christ on a daily basis. That you and I are to pick up our cross is daily and follow him. And just like Simon had his whole schedule interrupted, and can you imagine being with Jesus in those last few moments of Jesus' earthly life as he's carrying the cross up to Golgotha where Jesus is about to be crucified? You know, no one ever talks much about Simon anymore. No one ever says anything about him. But I'm telling you, it was an act of God to put him in that place where he's able to help Jesus, if you would, bear the load to carry the cross, the eye beam, to the place of crucifixion. You know, as we celebrate communion this morning, I'm not here to be heavy, but I'm here just to encourage you that life comes out of the cross. And a crucified life is just taking all of your passions and desires and wants and said, God, I just want to serve you. God, I just want to know you. God, I just want to walk with you. That when you do those things, God does some amazing things in your life. All of a sudden you realize that you're free. You're free to live for God. You're free to get rid of those fears. You're re- free to get rid of the worry and the doubt that just beset us. And all of a sudden you're saying, God, thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for this new life. As I keep referring to Letitia Wright, as she says, the actor said, you know what? I didn't realize I never had a relationship with God until I took those seven months and I pursued God and looked after God. And now I can just say this. I have a relationship with God. And it's no longer what I do for him. It's what he has done for me. And that's what communion is this morning. We are celebrating what Jesus has done for you and I. He came to set the captives free. Amen. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you this morning as we receive communion. The Lord, you'll just speak to us. Lord, we thank you in Psalms 23 that you've made us a promise. Surely, surely, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. So, Father, we speak that and we proclaim that. That Jesus, because you're our shepherd, because you're leading us and guiding us, We thank you that this promise will be fulfilled in Jesus' name.